Today we are going to talk about fractures. So I'll introduce the definition and its classification. So we'll begin with, with the recap on the anatomy of the bone. So we have the immature bone, also known as the woven bone, which is seen during the phase of fracture healing. And then we have the mature bone or lamellar bone, which is seen throughout the body. So the mature bone has got a compact bone or a cortical bone portion. And it has a spongy or a cancellous bone portion. So in the compact bone, the lamellar layers are densely arranged, while it is loosely arranged in a cancellous or spongy bone. Now, based on shape, you have four types, flat bones, irregular bones, long bones, and short bones. And then you have a fifth category known as the sesamoid bones. Now, regarding the parts of a long bone, since our discussion is slightly based on fractures of a long bone, so regarding the fracture of a long bone, you have the ends which are known as the epiphysis on either side and then you have the central or the shaft portion known as the metaphysis, sorry, known as the diaphysis. Now the portion adjacent to the diaphysis on either side is referred to as the metaphysis. Now between the epiphysis and the metaphysis, you have a plate known as the epiphyseal plate. So during the growth of a bone, the epiphysis fuses with the metaphysis and the epiphyseal plate gets converted into mature bone. Now regarding the blood supply of a bone, the ends of the epiphysis are supplied by the epiphyseal vessels and the uh, metaphysis by the metaphyseal vessels and the most of the bone is supplied by the nutrient vessels. The nutrient vessels in particular supply the inner two-third of the cortical bone. So the outer one-third of the cortical bone is supplied by the periosteal vessels which is not seen in this diagram. So the outer one-third by periosteal vessels and the inner two-third is by the nutrient vessels. Now we'll move on to fracture. So what is a fracture? A fracture is a break in the continuity of a bone. So it may be due to trauma or underlying disease or chronic repetitive injury or stress. So we will classify fractures based on different different factors. Now based on the cause, you can have three types as I mentioned earlier. Traumatic fracture. The fracture is caused by a trauma. So here the normal bone will take will break only with excessive force. The second category is pathological fracture. So this is a fracture through a bone which is weakened by some underlying disease. Here a, a bone will break with a trivial force or even no force. That is a pathological fracture. The third category is stress fracture. It is a fracture caused by chronic repetitive injury or stress. So here there is a break in the bony trabeculae and may not be visible on x-ray. So the patient may present with only pain at the site. Now based on displacement, you have the undisplaced fracture and the displaced. So undisplaced means a fracture without any displacement of the bony fragments. The displaced fracture means it's a fracture where with bony displacement caused usually by the fracturing force or the muscle pull on the fractured segment or, and or by gravity. So displacement may be a shift or an angulation or a rotation. So this is how it looks like. A shift may be an actual shift. Angulation may bends to one side and then rotation of a fractured segment. So it depends on the fracturing force, gravity as well as the pull of the muscles on the fractured segment. Now based on the relationship with the external environment, so we have two types. This is one of the most commonly used one. Close fracture and open fracture. So close fracture is a fracture where the fracture does not communicate with the external environment. That means the skin and soft tissues overlying the fractured segment is normal or intact. The open fracture, it's a fracture where the fracture communicates with the external environment. So it can be of two types. You have the internally open type and the externally open type. Now internally open means that the fractured end pierces the skin and, so and soft tissue resulting in the open fracture. So it is the fracturing, fractured end which causes the wound. Now externally open is where the object causing the fracture cuts through the skin and soft tissue resulting in the open fracture. Now here I must mention that we have the Gustillo classification or the Gustillo-Anderson classification 
of open fractures. So I'll just mention that here. Now that the previously mentioned was the basic classification of closed and open, but we have a named one. So open fractures can be of type one, type two, and type three. Type one means the lacerated wound is size is less than one centimeter. It's a clean wound. There is no contamination, and there is not much soft tissue injury. Type two means and there is a fracture. Type two is the the lacerated wound is more than one centimeter. It is minimal. Uh, it is still a clean or minimally contaminated, and there is mild to moderate. a soft tissue injury type 3 means there is uh, size can be of any size previously it used to be about 10 cm but now size of any size, wound can be of any size but there will be extensive soft tissue damage there can be multi fragmentary fractures segmental fractures bone loss severe crush injury severe wound contamination or a vascular injury and based on this it can be further subdivided into 3a 3b and 3c 3a is a type of uh, type 3 fracture where there is still adequate soft tissue to cover the bone now 3b means that the bone exposure is there or there is significant periosteal stripping and type 3c means there is an associated arterial injury now we continue with the basic classifications now based on the pattern of the fracture line you can classify it into a transverse fracture so the fracture line is perpendicular to the long axis of the bone oblique fracture the fracture line is oblique and a spiral fracture is where the fracture line runs spirally in more than one plane a comminuted fracture is a type of fracture with multiple bony fragments so it's usually caused by a crushing or a compressing force along the long axis of the bone a segmental fracture is a type of fracture where there are two fracture lines at different levels in the same bone so this picture will make it clear you can see the transverse fracture oblique fracture the spiral fracture comminuted fracture and the segmental fracture now a few words about pathological fracture once more so it's a fracture through a bone weakened by some underlying disease the bone may be weakened by a localized disease or by a generalized disease so osteoporosis is one of the considered as one of the most common metabolic causes of a pathologic fracture metastasis from a primary to a bone may also is also considered as one of the common causes for a fracture so these are some of the list of the common causes of pathologic fractures so we have localized disease so it can be osteomyelitis pyogenic or tubercular it can be tumors benign or malignant giant cell tumor a primary osteosarcoma evings tumor it can be a metastasis from a primary in the lung prostate or kidney see a breast like that in in the females it could be a localized swelling like a single simple bone cyst aneurysmal bone cyst it's not like granuloma now generalized diseases include genetic conditions like osteogenesis imperfecta dyschondroplasia osteopetrosis could be acquired like osteoporosis osteomalacia rickets scurvy could be multiple myeloma diffuse metastatic carcinoma and certain others like paget's disease so when we evaluate for a pathologic fracture our investigation should be directed looking for the underlying causes which will be discussed in the class on management of fractures now regarding the process of fracture healing so the fracture heals through a series of stages the first stage is a stage of hematoma so this will last up to 7 days so at the fracture site bleeding occurs and a hematoma is formed between and around the fracture ends the periosteum is stripped up from the fracture ends so this is one of the reasons for ischemic necrosis of the fracture ends so fracture end means about 1 to 2 mm of the fracture ends may undergo ischemic necrosis now osteocytes are sensitized during this phase so that they can later on differentiate into the daughter cells this is how it looks like you can see the stripped periosteum the fracture ends and you can see the hematoma the blood vessels are all are disconnected at this point now the second phase is a stage of granulation tissue it lasts about 2 to 3 weeks so here the sensitized precursor cells will produce cells which will differentiate to form the different blood vessels fibroblasts osteoblasts etc and this cellular tissue is known as the soft granulation tissue 
it gives a soft tissue anchorage to the fracture. Now remember, even though it gives anchorage, the fracture ends are still mobile during this phase. The blood clot will give uh, 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 forms a loose fibrous mesh and this blood clot serves as a framework for the growth of fibroblasts and new capillaries. The third stage is a stage of callus. So this is a stage where you, we see the earlier mentioned woven bone. So this may last about 3 to 4 months, so that's 4 to 12 weeks. The granulation tissue differentiates further to form the osteoblast. The osteoblast is responsible for the mineralization of the bony matrix. So it lays down the intercellular matrix which gets impregnated with calcium salts which forms the callus or the woven bone. So the callus is the first sign of union visible on X-ray. So you can see this, the clot is forming the framework, the vessels are joining. Now you can see the white, that is the formation of the callus. You can see that it is still getting more and more ossified over the period of 3 to 4 months. Now the next stage is a stage of remodeling. This is previously known as the stage of consolidation. This stage lasts about 1 to 4 years. So here the woven bone is replaced by mature bone with the typical lamella structure. So you can see here it is getting more and more dense and hard. And the final stage is a stage of modeling. This was previously known as remodeling. So here the bone gets gradually strengthened and there is modeling of the endosteel and the periosteal surface so that the fractured side becomes similar to the actual parent bone. It's more evident in children and less in adults. So this here is a picture as seen previously. So we have the hematoma and the periosteal elevation and the fractured end. The discoloration is for the uh, ischemic necrosis but it is usually only around 2 mm. So simplified diagram of the same thing, you just have to add the hematoma there. This is the cortical bone, this is the spongy bone. Hematoma, periosteal elevation, fracture end. And second stage, stage of granulation tissue. So here the, the hematoma gets slightly changed in color because it forms granulation tissue. And there is still a blood clot between the fracture end. Now the third stage, stage of callus formation, again more further change in color, the periosteum slightly reduces in size. You can see the more new bony callus formation there. The fourth stage is the remodeling. And the final, so at this point the bone is already joined together. In the final stage or the stage of modeling, the bone, the fractured end becomes similar to the parent bone. Now the diagram on the left is only for reference of the previously mentioned classification of uh, the stages and today the present style. Now one more word regarding bone healing. Now just like in bone healing we have two types of bone healing. Primary fracture healing and secondary fracture healing. Primary is where the fracture hematoma is disturbed. By disturbing I mean by doing an operation or a surgery to correct the fracture. Here the bone heals directly without any callus formation when an operation is done. So there also we have two types known as the contact healing where the fracture ends actually co have contact and then in some cases there may be a gap between the fracture ends known as gap healing. Both will result in a primary type of bone healing where there is no callus formation. Now secondary fracture healing is what we just now discussed where the fracture hematoma is not disturbed and is treated non-operatively. So here there is healing with callus formation. So this is the picture. It shows the gap healing here. And you have done a surgical intervention. And this is what we again discussed. Callus formation. Hematoma, callus and then the remodeling. Now a few words about the factors affecting fracture healing. So the age of patient is very important. A fracture unites faster in children. The type of the bone. A flat and cancellous bone will unite faster than a tubular and cortical bone. Pattern of fracture. A spiral fracture unites faster than an oblique fracture which unites faster than a transverse fracture. 
now disturbed patho anatomy so changes like soft tissue getting in between the fracture ends or the extent of ischemic fracture ends both can result in delayed fracture healing the type of reduction a good apposition of fracture results in faster healing immobilization so immobilization is of prime importance in the healing of certain fractures but like as in certain fractures uh, immobilization some may sometimes may not be required so you can use functionally you can use the part as in a fractured rib or a scapula there are restricted immobilization but we cannot do complete immobilization as it is involving the chest region where continuous breathing anyway has to happen now open fracture open fractures may go into delayed union or non union so having a closed fracture may be having better healing than a open fracture compression so compression helps in enhancing the rate of union in cancellous bone so these are some of the factors which can improve or delay the healing of a fracture site age of the patient the type of the bone the pattern of fracture line the disturbed patho anatomy type of reduction immobilization open fraction compression so here immobilization and compression helps in improving the rate of fracture healing so i'll end by saying the references again the reference for this class is the textbook of essential orthopedics 6th edition by dr maheshwari the pictures are obtained from google search thank you